I'm super excited that you are connecting with us today. I have a special treat for you that I'm going to introduce in just a few moments. But first, I want you to save the date for this coming Easter. We're going to have a spectacular online Easter celebration on Easter Sunday morning, 8 30, 10 15, and 12 noon. So go ahead and save the date. We're going to have all kinds of special surprises, including an incredible virtual choir made up of our adults and our young people. So you do not want to miss it. Uh, also, starting next week, I'm kicking off a brand new series called Choose Joy. Is it possible? to experience the joy that the Bible talks about in so many different ways in a world that is so riddled with pain and injustice. Is joy actually possible? I'm saying yes. You don't want to miss this series, and perhaps the most important series I've preached uh, to date. So get here next weekend and get ready to engage that series. Lastly, here's the special treat. I've invited a dear friend of mine, Pastor Gary Gadini, to bring the message today. He is the lead pastor of Peninsula Covenant Church, an, um, an amazing church here in the Bay Area. He's doing all kinds of incredible things. He's been the lead pastor there for 17 and a half years. And prior to that, check this out, he was on staff as the Minister of Student and Family uh, Ministries for 21 years and uh, the, the church has just done amazing things under his leadership. One of the things I like the most about him, he regularly calls me up and prays for me. He truly is a brother in the Lord. So after this video, get ready to be blessed by Pastor Gary. Sometimes it's moments of brokenness which create the greatest transformations. Times where fear gives birth to faith, pain leads to healing, and chaos dissolves into peace. It's in these times we often see God more clearly. For in our deepest turmoil, He remains faithful. When our spirit is crushed, He remains strong. When our moment is too heavy, He carries the burden. As gold is refined by fire, we too are often refined by struggle. It's part of growing, changing, becoming. Lately, the journey has been difficult. Our breath has been labored. Our steps uneasy. But we stand in faith knowing who is leading us through this desert. The God of peace, the God of hope, the God of restoration. Hey, what's up, NBCC? I'm Gary. I'm just up the road from your Redwood City location. And can I tell you what a gift from God that you are to Redwood City? I am so thankful for who you are. I'm honored to be here. And you probably know this, but in case you don't, your pastor is a gift to you and to the whole peninsula. I thank God for Pastor Herman. He is one of my closest friends in ministry. And more than that, he's like a brother to me. So uh, I thank God for him. I'm thankful that we can have this time together. I believe, and I bet you do too, that the Word of God does the work of God. So we're going to be in God's Word today. I can't wait to do that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for this church. And Lord, would you give us a word and a perspective? Jesus, would you emerge from this passage so that we can see you and live with hope? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to ask you a question as we start. What headlines are filling your minds these days? What headlines are flooding and filling your minds these days? I read a blog this fall from a pastor in Atlanta, and he said this in the blog. Sometimes I just want it to stop. Headlines on our home pages: COVID, racial pain, protests, politics, looting, police brutality, fires. I've become convinced that this is the new normal. This is real life. And then he writes, but then I met an 87-year-old man named Max. 
who talked of living through polio, diphtheria, the Vietnam protests, and he's still enchanted with life. He seems surprised when I said to him, 2020 must be especially challenging for him. Now listen in. The blogger writes, no. The man replied, looking me straight in the eyes. I learned a long time ago not to see the world through printed headlines. I see the world through people who surround me and love big. And then I write down my own headlines. Husband loves wife today. Family drops everything to come to grandma's bedside. And then he patted me on the hand, the blogger writes, old man finds new friend. His words collided with my worries, freeing them from the tether I'd been holding on to tightly. They float away, he said, and I'm left with a renewed spirit when I left that conversation. So I'm going to ask it again. What headlines are filling your minds today? You know, I think of my own headlines. I've got five daughters. Do you think that writes some headlines in my mind? Or I think of how many families have left the area because of COVID. There are plenty of things on my homepage that I can choose to have flood my mind. But I go to time and time again and have for this last year a passage in scripture that when Pastor Herman asked me to preach, I knew this is the one I wanted to share with you. Because what I want to do is renew all our minds with biblical headlines. Because when we flood our lives with headlines on our home pages, our hope is diminished. But when we renew our mind with biblical headlines, we become hope dispensers. That's why God created us and left us on the planet. So meet me in Ephesians chapter 2, if you will. And we're going to look at a letter written to a church in Ephesus. And I am not making this up. Ephesus in the first century was much like the San Francisco Bay Area in the 21st century. In the first century, it was the cosmopolitan center for commerce, for learning, for innovation, for progressive thinking and immorality. It would be easy to, for the Ephesian Christians to be headline inundated where they lived in Ephesus, just like it's easy for us to be consumed with headlines that flood our home screen, our home pages. And Paul writes this letter to this church to lift their head to eternal truths so that they can be renewed in their mind. In Ephesians 2, I see four headlines that I want to encourage each one of us to renew our mind with. Let's start with the first. Here's the first headline. Humanity has rebelled and cut ourselves off from our lifeline. Ephesians chapter 2 Verse one, here we go. Paul writes, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Mark this word dead, we'll come back to it. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Now stop right there. The word followed in the translation from the original language uh, almost makes it sound like we had a choice. Uh, this morning before I came here to record this message, I took my two dogs on a walk, put their harnesses on, and they followed me. That actually captures this word better than what we think of as if we had a choice. I chose the route. I chose the pace. I chose if we had to go or stop. Actually, they chose if they had to stop, but I kind of pulled them along. That's the sense of this word follow, that uh, apart from Christ, there are forces at work that guide us, and we have no way out but to be under their control. It'll say that. We followed the ways of this world, and here's the forces at work, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, the evil spiritual forces in our world. All of us also, I love that this is past tense, lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. And here's that word again, following its desires and thoughts. So, so now we have two things guiding us. We have the spiritual forces at work, and then we have our own cravings that are driving us in ways that aren't good. Like the rest, we were by nature 
deserving of wrath. I know it's not a pleasant headline, but let's just sit in that. Paul starts out in verse 1 to the Ephesian church and he says this, As for you, you were dead. Now just as physical death is the inability to respond to any stimulus, spiritual death is the inability to respond to the love of God. And this, friends, is the condition of every human being who's born on planet Earth. We are born with a sin nature spiritually dead and there's nothing in our own nature that can remedy this i remember five years ago my father died it was one of the worst experiences of my life my dad still is my hero dad taught me i'm 100 percent italian he taught me that family is everything growing up we had a family dinner table and every night that was a non-negotiable for me growing up all oh, the memories around that dinner table, or being with grandparents or uncles and aunts. It was rich. Well, I remember on the day that we had his memorial, before the memorial, my sister, brother, my kids, their kids, we all gathered in the cemetery. And before his casket was lowered into the ground, we just sat there around the casket and were laughing about memories of dad. We cried about how much we're gonna miss him. We talked about the love of a dad who stayed faithful to his marriage vows, to his death. We talked about how rich our lives were because of him. Dad would have loved it. It was everything he gave his life for, for what was experiencing there. But here's the sad thing. He couldn't talk back. He couldn't respond. Dad was present in body, but he was dead. No response. Where am I going with this? Paul says, and friends, this is the headline that drives every headline on our homepage. This is the headline behind every ism that we experience on this world. Racism, sexism, classism, uh, genderism, uh, generationism. This is the headline that drives it all. You've got to know this, right? This is not the world God designed. This is the world sin has marred. As for us, we are spiritually dead and we are following spiritual forces and our flesh. And that results in transgression and sin. Do you see that in the verse two? Transgression means to go farther than a boundary permits you to go. Sin literally means to not go far enough, to miss the mark. Morally speaking, when it comes to God, our spiritual condition, we have either crossed God's boundaries or we haven't gone far enough to love or give, uh, give or be generous the way God designed us to be. This is the first headline, friends. This sin nature, it's wreaked havoc and caused pain. But it gets better. The second headline is really important. Let's look at that one. God did the unthinkable when humans rebelled. This never gets old. I've been walking with Christ almost 40 years. It never gets old. He ran after them. He ran after them. See, friends, this is what makes Christianity unique amongst every other world religion. Every world religion believes in headline one, that there's some way we've fallen short of God's standard. But Christianity is unique because every other world religion says, then get better or do this or do that. Christianity says you can't be better. So God will come to your rescue. Look what it says. Let's read on in Ephesians 2. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. Right there we see what's in the heart of God when he looks at every human being. God doesn't look at our world broken by sin. God doesn't look at moral rebels and say, you disgust me. I'm so disappointed in you. God doesn't say, Make your, you made your bed, now sleep in it. You get what you deserve. That's not what God says. God looks at your neighbors, your friends. God looks at you and me. And he has great love in his heart. Every motive of everything that happens in your life, the motive behind that from God is great love. It's rich mercy. 
What did he do? What's the number one need of dead people? Life. He made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. Look what it says next. It is by grace that you have been saved. I love that. So you need to know this. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. God ran after us. Jesus came to earth, God in the flesh, to make dead people come to life. This is an indictment on our human condition. The first headline says we weren't just a little off-center morally. No, friends, we were in a, such a desperate situation that nothing short of God himself unzipping eternity, stepping into time, dying and taking the wrath we deserved would remedy it. I'll say it again. God didn't come to earth to make bad people good. He came to earth to bring dead people to life. Come to me to the most dead place on the planet. It's in Chile. It's called the Atacama Desert. Look at this. It is so lifeless that when NASA is exploring what life is like on planet Mars, they go to the Atacama Desert to learn about it. It is a barren place where there is nothing flourishing until a few years ago. I'm not making this story up. A few years ago, the Atacama Desert received seven years worth of rain, normal rainfall, in 12 hours. And look what it became. Something called a super bloom came up through the desert. Why? Because beneath the barren land were seeds of flowers. And when an outside source, oh, you know where I'm going with this, right? When an outside source of life came in, it regenerated those seeds, turning the desert into a super bloom. That's why the title of this message is God has come to make us radiant. Friends, this, this is a picture of what God wants for every human life to make us into a super bloom through his Holy Spirit, to take what is dormant and bring it to life. And not just dormant souls, certainly. I am a testimony. I am not a pastor or even a follower of Jesus because I'm good. I'm a follower of Jesus because I'm forgiven and God's Spirit has brought me to life. But then he brought many other things to life around me. Dormant relationships came to life because of the Spirit of God and the new operating system in me that could love with the love of another kind. A dormant in my marriage, there's places that were dormant. God's brought them back to life. Uh, there was aspects in our marriage with money management. It was dormant. It wasn't done God's way. And then God, we submitted it to the Savior. He brought it back to life. God is in the business of life, my friends, of life. I, I want to just ask right now, what is dormant in your life? Maybe it's you and you just need to turn right now. Quit listening to me. Listen to the Spirit of God and say, yes, Jesus. Yes, step into my life. I want to follow you as my Lord. God will regenerate you and bring you to life. But what is around your life that is dormant? What I have learned in 40 years of walking with Jesus is this. He's still in the business of saving. I just seen it even this week with people I've been praying for that have given their life to Christ and now they're a new creation. But I've seen it throughout my life, through relationships and aspects of my life. Jesus is still in the business of saving what is submitted to him. Now look at verse eight, look where this goes. Paul says, it is by grace, that just means a gift. He'll reiterate that word in a minute. It's by grace that you have been super bloomed, rescued, saved, through faith, that just means trust. You're not trusting in your own works, you're trusting in the work of Jesus. And then he, just to reiterate that, he says, this is not from yourselves. Again, I would tell you, this is what makes the faith system of Christianity unique over every other faith system on the planet. Our faith system is built on the works of another, the work of Jesus. It's not of yourselves, it is a gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. Friends, this is the core truth of our faith. 
Jesus saves. Jesus rescues. Jesus regenerates. Do you know what the name Jesus literally means? It means God saves. When he walked the planet, he gave his own mission statement. He said, the Son of Man has come to earth to seek and to save what is lost. Don't you love that? He still wants to do that through you and through me. Who loves a great comeback story? I know your pastor well enough. He's a huge fan of the Golden State Warriors. I was at a conference with him in Colorado, and that guy was going nuts during the playoffs over the Warriors. The Warriors have great comebacks, right? We all love a great comeback story. Your life, if you're a Christian, is the greatest comeback story on the planet today because our life is based on the greatest comeback in history. We're going to celebrate it in about five weeks, the Easter story. When everything was dead on Good Friday, when Jesus looked uh, and was completely massacred and brutally treated, three days later, he came back to life. It's the greatest comeback story in history because Jesus wants every life to be a comeback story. That's pretty good, isn't it? But it gets better. Let's look at the next headline, the third headline. In Christ, we are restored and repurposed poemas. I'll explain poemas in a minute. But restoration and repurposing, that's kind of in right now, right? Our family just subscribed to the Discovery Plus network so we could watch the new uh, episodes of Fixer Upper. We love it. Taking what's dilapidated and Chip and Joanna, they got, they got the mojo going and, and creating something from ruin into something that was great and is repurposed for amazing uh, family and whoever occupies the home. This, my friends, this headline and where we're going in Ephesians 2 is the greatest restoration story ever. Every other restoration story we see on the screen or we look at when we were able to go into theaters on the big screen is based on the restoration of Jesus Christ. Look at this. Paul says, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. We just read this. It's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. Now, here's where he goes with it. For we are God's handiwork. Again, the Bible was not written in English in the West. It was written in a Greek language. The New Testament was in the East. The word handiwork there is poema. Now, stop there for a second. Uh, poema. It's a word we get poetry from, obviously, or poem. In the first century, in the Greco-Roman world, when an artist was defined by a work of art. When, when they wanted to point to the greatness of an artist and they turned to the work of art that defined the artist, that work of art was called his poema, his masterpiece, his handiwork. We are God's poema. That's what Paul's saying. In other words, hold on to this, New Beginnings. When all the universe, the angelic beings up in heaven are saying to God, you are great, you're amazing, your works are marvelous. They don't point to the vast stars or the galaxies. They don't point to Yosemite Valley, as beautiful and breathtaking as that is. You know who they point to? You in Christ, me. What's going on right here? They point to the church, men and women exalting, living for Jesus, who were once dead but are now alive. And they say to God, you're amazing. We are icons of God's glory, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's always a step ahead of us. We are his masterpiece. So I told you I'm Italian. I love all things Italy. Uh, my family still has a home. It's not my home, but it's the heritage. The Gadinis have been living in it since the 18th century. It's in Lucca in Tuscany, and it's just north of a town called Florence. I was there four years ago with my daughters to introduce them to their ancestral home. And while we were in Florence getting on our way to go to Lucca, we stopped in the Uffizi to visit this. 
the statue of David. That dude's 17 feet tall. It is a masterpiece of Michelangelo. When they point to Michelangelo, and he was a great architect, artist, and sculptor, but when they point to how great of a sculptor was, they look at this statue. You know, the backstory on this is pretty amazing. One artist actually tried to sculpt the slab that this came from years ago, like 50 years before Michelangelo got to it. And he gave up and he said, nothing good can come from this stone. Others tried and it ended up in a quarry for 40 years until Michelangelo came walking by and saw the slab of stone. And he talked about as a sculptor how he believed the job of the sculptor was to free the forms that were already in the stone. It's amazing when you get up close to think about the expression on David's face, the, the tense muscle system that he has, his neck, his veins bulging. You can see calmness and confidence and tension in the same thing. His eyes will follow you as you walk around. I am telling you, this is a work of art. It's a poema. And when people point to the greatness of Michelangelo, they talk about this statue. When people point to the greatness of God, we've been redesigned in Christ Jesus. So they look to us and go, oh my gosh, that's a great God. Our lives should make no earthly sense when they're empowered by the Spirit of God and when we have a new operating system pulsating in us, when the Word of God is fueling us. And when we're living in community, being sharpened and doing all those one another's that we should be doing in the church to one another, I am telling you what, that creates a masterpiece where humanity looks at us and says, oh, there must be a great God. What does this mean? It means you're beautiful. It means you're valuable. It means you're an expression of the divine artist if we've been recreated in Christ, God himself. You see, when Jesus went to the cross, what was on his mind was not, I'm going to die just so you know I love you. That was there, but it's so much more than that. New beginnings. He said, I'm going to die for your splendor. I'm going to die so that I can recreate you into something magnificent. I'm the artist, was on the heart of Jesus. You're the art. I'm the painter. You're the canvas. I'm the sculptor. You're the marble. You don't look like much in the quarry, God says to you. Oh, but wait till I get my hands on you. I can see who you can become through me. God's an artist. And you've got to believe this third headline, that you are his crowning achievement, recreated and restored and repurposed. God prepared good works in advance, verse 10 says, for us to walk into. That's pretty good, isn't it? But it gets better. Now, now, understandably, most of us stop at verse 10, that we are radiant poemas in the hands of God, but it gets better. Let's read in verse 11. Paul didn't stop writing the book of Ephesians in 2.10. It meant to be read through, and here's what he says. Therefore, in other words, verse 1 to 10 doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists for a purpose, and therefore tells you the purpose of verse 1 to 10. Remember, that you and friends, I want to invite you right now, remember, formerly you who are Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcised by those, let's just stop here, Gentiles, can you go back, is uh, in the Greek language, again, the original language, it's the word ethnos. Paul's going to step into now an ethnic religious tension. Think we have some racial tensions right now in our country? It breaks my heart. Paul's going to give the answer, God's remedy, and this is why I think the church should be, God forgive us for not being on the front end of the racial conversation, designed to be a model for what could happen in the world. Forgive us, Lord, for not being that. So, called the uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that's the religious tension he's building out. With that which is done in the body by human hands. Remember, at one time, you were separate from Christ. This is so sad. Excluded from citizenship in Israel. 
foreigners to the covenants of the promise. And look at this line. This design, this, this describes every pain socially, morally, relationally, physically in the world without hope, without God, and in the world. Oh, it makes me so sad. Without hope, without God in the world. Let's keep reading. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near. Now he's going to show a brand new community that's emerged on the planet by the blood of Christ. For Jesus himself is our peace. He's made the two groups, look at this. Paul reaches for a word, one. He reaches for the word that back in Deuteronomy chapter six, when God asked, uh, described himself in Deuteronomy six, he says, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. When God is describing his design for marriage, the covenant of marriage, he talked about the two shall become one one. And God says there's something else that should be one, the people of God, the church. They once were divided, Gentiles, Jews, circumcised, uncircumcised, different ethnicities, but in Christ there's no division. We're reconciled. He's destroyed the barrier. Look at this. The dividing wall, this describes our year, right? Hostility. Hostility. Let's keep reading. His purpose was to create in himself, and here it is, one new humanity. Uh, there's different Bible words for new. Uh, this word talks about new in kind, uh, a new product on the scene. Think about how Tesla disrupted the automobile market in industry. Think about how the iPhone disrupted the cell phone industry because they were new. They weren't just new by being refreshed. They were new in kind, new in type. God has created his church to be what Tesla was to the automobile industry, what, what we should be to humanity, a new type of humanity, one new way of functioning. A brand new people has emerged so the world can look at us living and functioning in our gifted, spirit-empowered way, one another in one another, mutually empowering, mutually encouraging, just like the Trinity does. The Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. That's what God's created out of us, out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, he's referring there to the cross, Jesus, but also the church. In one body, here it is, to reconcile. The word reconcile means to make enemies friends, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. There's, my friends, why we have the corner on unity, because we know the way to unity is this reconciliation to God, that when people are reconciled to God, a new operating system comes into us. Remember headline two? And we are functioning in a different way. Remember headline three? So that we can be peacemakers in our world. Do you think our world needs peace? Do you think our state needs peace right now? <laughs> Do you think our peninsula needs peace right now? Absolutely. And God's answer to all these isms and divisions and sin and pain is the church. Functioning as one. Functioning together in a brand new way. I got to tell you, what I've experienced from every NBCC member, and I, I am not overstating this, what I've experienced from your pastor is this kind of spirit. In New Beginnings, that's why I think God's hand is on you, and that's why I think God has brought me here on February 28th, 2021, to spur you on, not to be inundated with headlines on our home screen, but be in, inundated with biblical headlines spurred on by the greatest comeback story ever, which we'll celebrate in five weeks. So as we close, I want to ask this final question for you. You have been recreated in Christ Jesus to be a radiant reconciler. What are the good works God has recreated you for right now? Remember what Ephesians 2.10 says, he did this in advance. In other words, before you wake up, 
God has designed good works for you to walk into. Reconciliation opportunities to be a peacemaker. And it's never needed more than right now. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that it's living and active, that it does a work. I pray that we would humble ourselves before you, that you would do the work in us that you want today. Jesus, oh, how we love you. Thank you for having great love and rich mercy when we were just moral rebels. Lord, may new beginnings be saturated with supernatural headlines. May they be saturated with biblical headlines so that they can be hope dispensers up and down the peninsula. Pray this in your name, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Wow, what a powerful message. Think about this, that through the work of Jesus Christ, if you said yes to him, God has repositioned you and repositioned me, not to be powerless, but to be reconcilers in this broken world. What an awesome message. Thank you, Pastor Gary, for sharing with us. Listen, here's the question. How will we now respond? I want to challenge you to go to our app and, and go to our connection card section. So here's, here's what you do. Uh, open up the app. You'll see the connection card uh, section. Hit that link. You'll see Sunday screen. Tap on that. Uh, and then you'll see next steps. Go there. And the first opportunity for you to make a decision is to say, I want to be a Jesus follower. I want to experience his reconciling, his reconciling work in my life and his redeeming work. Okay, And there's some other options there that you can consider checking off as your next step of faith. Now, under the response to the message, I can't imagine a better way for you and I to be set aside and empowered for this incredible work of being reconcilers in the world than to engage in the next 40 days in a season of prayer and fasting. And we have launched that here at NBCC and we invite you to participate. There are two boxes under the response to the message. The first is simply to say, count me in, I'm, I'll commit. Just check that box. The second box is for you to check if you want me to help make that journey easy for you. And here's the deal. If you check that second box, I'm gonna send you an email every day and that email will include a prayer that you can pray, a scripture that you can read and reflect on, and from time to time, an exercise that you can engage in. It will take five minutes or less for you to have a God encounter time every day uh, all the way till Easter. So if you want more information about our 40 days of prayer and fasting, journey to Easter, just go to our website, nbccbarry.com. Have all that information. I hope you join us for this journey. Now, whatever you do, make sure you're back here next week, weekend. You do not want to miss my series, Choose Joy.